Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Abby Fry. I'm the Communications Manager at Moodle. And today we're going to be exploring the topic of the edtech market in the US. And I'm pleased that we've got Jonathan Moore, who's the head of Moodle US, here to talk about that with me today. So firstly, hello, Jonathan. Hello, Abby. Well, Jonathan, you are a great person to have here. I know that you have been a learning technology strategist for over 20 years. You've had so many different roles. In fact, I believe you started your career of, as director of technology in public schools. You've worked as chief technology officer, vice president of business development operations. And of course, you've co-owned your own consultancy or services business, My Learning Consultants which indeed has become Moodle US. So I'm, I'm interested to find out, how did you find yourself in the sector? Was it learning first or technology first, or maybe it was both? Technology as a kid. Um, I can remember working uh, in a cornfield to earn my first computer at the age of 12. So uh, lifelong love of technology and then um, kind of a personal relationship with with my wife Michelle um, who started as a classroom teacher and that's how I really got my start as a, a technology director is her early years she'd come home and kind of talk about some of the challenges that she was seeing um, doing a very early um, kind of a technology training for middle school students and and I you know naively was like I think I can do better than that and so that that was the start of getting into the education side of things and and that's been a you know 20 year plus collaboration yeah and i mean technology has certainly disrupted education it has for you know since the beginning of whiteboards really or overhead projectors Many people say that the pandemic has been the major disruptor, but do you see it like that? Because technology, you know, even Moodle, for instance, has been around for 20 years. So what are your thoughts? I think it's accelerated things. Um, I, I don't know that it's brought about any um, anything new that wasn't already happening, but it's maybe accelerated things five years down the road, um, maybe 10 years down the road in some cases where um, the technology was already pretty mature. Um, and then, so you start to have that, that situation of if, um, you have an impetus to try it, then you find out, oh, this actually does work. So I, I think it has accelerated things. Um, you know, I look back to some things earlier in my career, uh, being a tech director in a rural, relatively rural area in Kansas, um, all the way back in the late eighties, there were these schools, um, that were driving the technology and they're these little tiny kind of, if you blink, you might miss them on the road. Um, and they had some of the highest tech video conferencing technology anywhere. And that was out of necessity because, um, as accreditation requirements increased, so you had to have foreign language and you had to have specialty science classes as a small school district you just couldn't maintain that level of staffing to have all of those specialties. So to keep accreditation and really like to kind of keep their communities uh, alive, they, they formed these cooperatives. So you'd have um, literally four TV screens mounted on the ceiling of these classrooms and they would connect with four other, four other schools and they would share teachers. Very, very high tech, very high speed connections um well before it's really associated with you know kind of the modern distance education ed tech um so and i think that parallels kind of martin's experience right of um the kind of ham radio in the outback um re remote education so it, it's interesting to me right is these areas that you don't normally associate with technology have really driven the adoption of it uh, into its modern form Mm, it's a really nice juxtaposition, you know, this idea that it's actually necessity and almost remoteness that promotes development. And I imagine yeah. that is um, 
is nuanced by sector. I mean, let's talk about schools. That example that you gave, I think it was schools, wasn't it, in those remote communities? Yeah. But as one sector, uh, you know, a, become an early adopter than another sector, or is it you've seen developments really across the board? Yeah, I would say, you know, especially in the case of Moodle, um, in those early days, we did see a lot of K-12 schools really pushing that, and even individual classroom teachers that um, would bring, you know, they would they would have kind of a, a guerrilla installation um, that they just set up on their own, and then um, but it, it would just grow. So, uh, for instance, that's kind of how Michelle and I came across Moodle was she was working on her master's degree and she was wanting to implement um, some of the techniques that she was seeing and there for, for uh, price reasons, there just weren't a lot of options that we could afford. So we started trying all these different open source solutions and eventually landed on Moodle. And, and I can remember walking her through installing that on just like a donated computer. And then a couple of weeks later, looking and seeing, well, she had recruited six other teachers and it went it quickly from an experiment to they were doing the real work of education in their classroom. And so we quickly had to actually migrate it to a newer server and do backups and all, all the things that you would do in a production environment. So um, to make sure that you had continuity of service and that you weren't going to lose any of the you know, kind of history of the education that was done. So, um, definitely saw a lot in K-12 and um, kind of ch uh, charter schools, sort of a little bit off the mainstream, but then moved towards the mainstream. And then we saw um, community colleges have a, they're a little bit, tend to be a little bit smaller, a little bit more agile. And also some of those same economics where um, need to stretch a dollar. So we saw a lot of adoption there. And then as Moodle gained credibility and really like that kind of web delivered distance education grain credibility and some research behind it, then we started to see more of the um, like university type institutions adopting it. Um, and that those traditional institutions, right, that are slower moving. And then more recently, um, just huge growth in the business sector and seeing, seeing a need for those similar tools. Yeah, amazing. School teachers are, I guess, in the way they're their own bosses often. They're running their own show in their own classroom. Yes. And so that allows them to explore new ideas has that really shifted have the, has the demands from customers from your perspective in a service role changed a lot over time they really have um i you know i think back to kind of our early years with moodle and we would um put michelle on a plane and um Kathy Robeson, another team member, we would put them on planes and send them out to clients. And we did a lot of on-site training. And we also would do uh, things like we would say, um, four months from now, we're going to have a group training session in Atlanta. And we would advertise that we were, we were going to do this group training and we would send out uh, an, uh, an educational trainer and then often a technical trainer that would teach Moodle administration. And we'd have three days in a hotel and we might have, you know, 40, 40 participants group training. And it was very focused on the mechanics, right? Which menus do you click on? How do you set this up? Um, what are the different course creation settings? So it was very focused on the mechanics of how do you use this tool? Now, fast forward to today, um, there's still a need for training, but we tend to do that more um, as one-on-one -on -one onboardings with a particular organization. And then we really do the training on the parts that they're going to do every day. So there's still a little bit of that mechanical aspect, but less so. And more of the focus is really on what are your organizational goals? What's your budget? And then we'll synthesize based on the best practices that, that we've gained over time, both you know, through reading research, but also through experience 
and, and we'll try to come up with what's the optimal way of setting this up that factors all three of those in. And, and then that's the consulting part. And so oftentimes we will be interviewing the client and then saying, well, we're going we're gonna to do this particular setting because of this information that you've given us. And it's a one-time thing. So um, in, you can imagine there's a vast difference in how you might set up the software for a higher ed institution that has a traditional two semesters per year um, undergraduate degree type program versus uh, a corporation that is adopting Moodle for compliance training. So they want to make sure everybody's had their safety, OSHA training, uh, maybe bloodborne pathogens where it's we need to make sh make sure this happens same training every year, and we need to we need to know who hasn't taken this training so we can go and find them and make sure they get it on time. Mm. So it's almost as if that simple model um, from the early days in which you were, you know, one-on-one -on -one or in group settings, teaching people quite simply, this is how you use the tools. And from a technical perspective, this is how you set up courses that, that has become more complex as time's gone by. And that consulting model is much more sophisticated where you're working with lots of different people to understand what their goals are. And then it sounds like maybe you map your solution to their needs. Would that be right? That's very much so the case. Um, and some of that even goes all the way back to that experience with the classroom teacher that had the ambition to just go set their own Moodle server up. So learning that um, even in a situation where it maybe seems like choice is not available, that um, people will find choices. So um, that kind of has guided a lot of how we, how we do things, which is really to think about always um, kind of selling the solution in a way to make sure that it is actually useful to the individuals in that organization. And that's different for every organization. And that's, I think, where Moodle has been really successful is because it is so flexible. Uh, it can be a very different solution for the uh, university versus uh, K-12 school versus, uh, you know, maybe it's a charity organization. Um, so it, it, it can kind of be a chameleon and, and do different things. So, yeah, that has become more, more and more important. Um, and, and you think back to the early days, we were really breaking new ground. There was no research to be really had right on what the best practices. So now we've had the, also the benefit of um, researchers and experience to say, well, you know, if you do this, it's not going to work out as well. But if you do it a little bit differently, then it can be very successful. Mm. And I imagine um, the requirements. So that is nuanced by sector a little bit. So what I mean by that is, is for some universities, do that? Can you see trends in what they need help with versus, let's say, you know, um, a corporate organisation or perhaps a not-for-profit that's looking for to implement training programs? So, what? How are you seeing those changes shift by sector? Yeah, you know, I would say there's um, a, a general progression towards, um, and this is maybe a little bit of our, our bent on how we see education, but um, there has been a, a general trend towards being more open to really interactive education. So like in, in the case of Moodle, it's based on social constructivism. So you construct your learning by interacting with others. Um, across the board, I think there's been a growing acknowledgement of the value of that. Um, I would say um, you know, your traditional educational institutions probably got that sooner than the corporate sector, where corporate sector is a lot driven by that kind of compliance function. And it's really, you know, ticking a legal box off. But we're, we're seeing even in that sector now an acknowledgement that maybe we can get a bit more out of that training than um, we did previously. So we get the tick box, but also maybe it's a little bit more durable, a little bit more effective in terms of actually changing the behavior of the employee. 
And I want to just go back to this idea of flexibility. And you talked about Moodle being flexible. What, why is it so flexible? What, what provides it that flexibility? Yeah, so I think there's a couple things. One is um, Martin, I think from day one had this. So the M in Moodle used to stand for modular. Um, so kind of from day one, this idea that there would be plugins. And so at a very technical plumbing architectural level, it's built into the system. So, so it's well designed to be flexible is, is the first thing. But then you have this also open source aspect of Moodle where if you want to change it, you can. And, and it's pluggable. So you can do it in a way actually that's very um, maintainable. So you, um, if you want to modify Moodle a little bit, you don't have to take on the heavy workload of maintaining an entire LMS. You can take on a much more manageable part, which is just some very specific bit of functionality. Um, and there is something about the Moodle community, I think it being an educational tool, that it's also always had this really good community and really good documentation. So um, I think you've, I think a lot of teachers were really, um, they felt a lot of um, very positive feelings around Moodle that it did this thing for them in their classroom and they want to give back. And so, um, and not all of them, I mean, most teachers are not coders. Um, so how do they get back? Well, they can write documentation. And so it always had really better documentation than most open source tools and a, a very welcoming and friendly community that just wasn't solely driven by developers. Um, so I think that has led towards people wanting, so we have this really good library of community plugins. You have almost 2000 plugins that members of the community have contributed. Um, so even if let's say you don't wanna take on that, even the smaller burden of maintaining a plugin, there might be a plugin that does the thing you want. And so in terms of that flexibility, um, th there's a lot of long tail functionality for Moodle. So um, maybe Moodle does 80% of what you want out of the box. And then maybe there's two or three plugins that have already been done in the community that also speak to your niche use case. But for another organization, it, it might be an entirely different set of plugins and a, and a different set of the core functionality but now it meets your use case. So I think that's, th those are kind of the two major reasons why Moodle has been able to be so flexible. And in the early days, people were attracted by the idea of hosting on premise. Has that shifted over time? It has. Um, and I think a lot of that is a growing awareness that uh, it's easy enough to install any software and run it. Um, but it's not as easy to sort of maintain it. And it's become a bit more of a hostile environment when you think about this as a tool. It's typically put on the internet and you know, we have a growing awareness of the value of privacy. Um, so you have legal frameworks like GDPR, you have the privacy law in California here in the US that um, are codifying the importance of that privacy. And so the stakes are higher if, if you don't do it right. Um, and then we're also operating at a larger scale and the bad guys, frankly, have gotten more sophisticated, right? We have not just, um, I, I think early days, it was a lot, can I just borrow some server resources and you know maybe I'm gonna send spam with that or I'm going to, um, I'm gonna put a little secret website on your web server. Um, so not great, but the impact was relatively low. Now you have very sophisticated operators that, you know, maybe they're uh, going to try to encrypt all of your data and lock it away and then um, extort you for money in order for you to get your data back. Or they're very specifically trying to extract this data in order to do identity theft or, you know, various attacks. We, we, we all see these things in the news. So it's become more... You have to do more homework to, to really um, do a good job of hosting these platforms. 
and then they're also a lot bigger, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, it's not, uh, you know, maybe 10 teachers that came together and they're doing a small little Moodle site. It might be, um, like we were just, um, talking with, a like a entire nation's K-12, so primary, secondary schools, they want to do an implementation for everybody in the country. Um, and that's a little bit coming out of COVID where they're wanting to, they want to supplement the normal classroom, but they want to have a just in case. So they want to be more prepared for the next, whatever it would be that um, might mean we can't do face-to-face -face school. That's a very different problem than you know, I'm going to, I'm going to use an old server that somebody donated from the community and I'm going to put it up for uh, a couple teachers in one building. Uh, so there, there, a lot more technical know-how goes into that um, than uh, what we did back way back in the day. Mm, it's like the perfect storm, you know, we've got COVID. So the demands on online systems are much, much bigger, presumably as more and more learners have come online. You've got increasing sophistication with cybersecurity attacks and issues around data security, scalability. Yeah, I, I can see that there's all these things working together. Uh, Organisations are under much more pressure and consequently they probably need the specialist services of organisations that can help them sleep at night. I think you, I've heard you say before, Jonathan. Yeah, yeah. We, we do. We hear that a lot from clients and um, it is definitely sort of a design principle for us. Um, it is that because we want to sleep at night, too. So doing that homework and the planning and and uh, really making sure that things are up to par for today's challenges. And I think the other thing is it's kind of shifted, you know, from this kind of side experimental thing right to especially you look at during covid um where in a lot of cases that was primary delivery now and so the stakes are higher even in terms of uh it needs to stay running yeah that's what i wanted to talk about next this idea of it becoming primary de delivery i mean there has been stigma historically that online learning is lower quality than uh, traditional face-to-face -face delivery even though the research would suggest otherwise i feel like that's shifting and i'm curious to see if you agree and if you do why yeah um you know one of the things I always think of when this topic comes up is you look at how uh, higher ed is ranked in the U.S. and it's typically a, a direct result of how many students are turned away. So what what is your acceptance rate is, act, is, is often one of the kind of number one factors in how good is this school? And, and so by definition, it's sort of uh, traditionally been this exclusive operation. And so anytime you have that dynamic and then you have a new thing that comes in that actually broadens the availability, it's perceived as lesser. This is less exclusive. It has to be not as good. Um, so we've had lots of examples over a number of years of where organizations are being successful with online delivery. They're getting good outcomes. There has been academic research done that shows it is equally as effective. Um, and so, it, and there's also some economic drivers, right, where there's some early adopting organizations that have been very successful in doing that. And so um, that's gotten the attention of even, you know, a lot of these traditional um, kind of Ivy League schools, if you will, that um, they're, they're now doing those same things with online programs. Um, so I think over time, yeah, it has become more accepted. And then, um, again, in my own personal cases, I, I went back to school after I was in the workforce and I did it online and it, it was the only way I could do it with my schedule. So it would have been a choice either to um, stop a career that was going well or not be able to progress at an educational level. And, and simply around just scheduling issues. Um, so I, I think a lot of, especially in that, you know, I think of um, the Louisiana Resource Center 
um, that, that you've interviewed previously is that's sort of their entire model. And they were able to shift that um, to a well-designed online program and actually broaden the adults that they were reaching. So same quality level, but take away some barriers so you have higher participation. Absolutely. And I know that you have a team of learning designers, or perhaps you call them instructional designers, as part of your offering. Um, and again, that's the idea of it's not just the technology, is it? It's pedagogy and yeah. technology together. Is that something that's developed over time? Are they a big part of the Moodle US business? It, it is. Um, I, you know, I think back to... Um, there was a, a Moodle conference in 2008, and I did uh, I did a session on basically technical administration of Moodle, and I had a double conference room, standing room only, packed, and it was you know one of the biggest draws of this particular conference, and I think it was a point in time, right? Moodle has some traction, it's it has some maturity. And people wanted to know how to do the technical parts to run it. Um, I can still do that presentation today, but it's not that big of a draw like it was. But um, if we were to put up one of our learning designers and talk about the, you know, 10 biggest mistakes in your uh, remote education program, that would draw a lot more. And so the way I see it is we've gotten a lot better at the technical side of it, but it's the table stakes. The, it's just what we have to do in order to do the actual work that we're most driven by, which is, are we delivering good education? And, and so to me, the most important part of our organization are really is that learning design, instructional design uh, functionality. Um, and the, again, kind of a cliche, maybe way to put this, but if you don't know how to use the technology, it's as good as broken. So, yeah. Um, so it's really only as valuable as how well we use it, right? It's it, it, at the end of the day, it's a hammer or a screwdriver. And so what's the best way to use that tool? And it, it takes, it, it, it's quite sophisticated and it is very different than, um, the techniques that you use for face-to-face. -face. And you've explained to me that over time that uh, customers, and particularly perhaps large customers, whether they're universities, perhaps very big colleges, they have outsourced more of their um, technical support. Um, do you think there is now a bit of a move for them to also seek assistance with learning design, I guess, if you think about it from their perspective, perhaps that's been a longer journey because they are in the, after all, in the business of education and teaching and they feel as if, oh, perhaps we've got that covered. But actually, as you say, it's, it's a different skill to know how to take pedagogy into an online environment and do it well. So I'm wondering about that. You've seen this move where people have outsourced more of their technical support and perhaps now um, a growing requirement. Okay, we actually need to know how to use these tools tools well, and we either need to build those skills internally, or perhaps we seek support with, say, your learning design team, for instance. Yeah, you know, obviously we have kind of a skewed view of things because we interact with the people that reach out to us, um, or maybe we reach out to them like through conferences and. Um, our marketing activities, but ultimately we see the certain view of things. Um, so what I would say is it's, it's a mixture. Um, there are a growing number of clients that do value that type of service of we're going to help you with that confluence of knowing educationally good practices, but also understanding this tool really well. So, so there's this practical aspect, right? Like, um, Social constructivism, for instance, it's been around for a while as an educational philosophy, but I know the personal journey um, that I saw Michelle go through, which is she's known about those types of theories for a long time, but how do you actually implement that in a, in a real classroom, the practicalities of applying a theory? 
Uh, and I think that's where we really shine is we do understand the theory. We have very smart people that have invested a lot of time in understanding that. They invest a lot of time in staying on top of what research is saying is, is effective and how it's fine tuning over time. But they also know this tool really well. So they've, they've been able to synergize those two aspects so they can come in and say, you know, this, this good educational practice that there's a research paper on that's been peer reviewed this is how you actually implement that in Moodle. So there's a lot of value there. And, and um, so we have clients that recognize that, they come in and they engage us to do that. But we also will often have um, new clients that will say, well, I don't know if we even need a, an onboarding. Um, we've been doing web delivery for a while. We think we have it figured out. Um, so there, so there is equally some skepticism around, well, I think I have it figured out already. Um, and, and there's good and bad, right? Like, um, I, we're rarely stumped on, on some improvement, some advice that's actionable. Um, even when it's, you, even when you're very good at a thing, having another set of eyes and another perspective to come in and say, well, have you thought about implementing it this different way? Um, and, and I saw this dynamic on the technical level when I switched from being a very good K-12 technology director that I felt like I had things figured out, but I had things figured out for my school's use case. And that took me about almost a decade to get to there. Um, and then when I went over to the kind of Moodle services side, I had to relearn because there were so many different ways that people were using Moodle. And then over time, now I have a, a broader perspective because I've seen a lot of different ways of doing it. Um, so I think that same thing is the case on the instructional side where, um, and in fact, we, we do a lot of even where um, we might embed a full-time instructional designer in a client organization. And um, we used to say, well, we'll help you hire somebody. And now um, we say, actually, that same person is probably going to be more effective as part of our team that is part of a bigger instructional design group and that is also seeing other organizations' implementations uh, because they're, instead of being just the, you know, the lone designer in a team, they're part of a, a really dynamic team that has a lot of interaction and they're establishing best practices. So same person, just different environment. Um, can be more effective. So I, I think that's part of the dynamic. Um, and one thing that we kind of, along these lines, if you're a little bit skeptical about that, um, is we do these little course audits that, you know, it can be a couple hours, they could be half a day, a day, but where we'll go in and actually look at one or two courses and, and just sort of write up a report based on that, that again, that confluence of, what does the research say? How to use this particular tool practically? Um, and, and that's a very kind of a lightweight way to see, am I missing something? Kind of where am I at with this practice? Yeah, you're looking for the sweet spot. Um, and it's really good. I can see coming in at a micro level and looking at one course that allows you to evidence that. But it is really cerebral. That's a really difficult thing to do is to understand uh, research and theory and then translate yeah. that to a tool. It takes a, a, an absolute skill set. I, I totally support that. I, that makes a lot of sense to me. And it leads me into thinking about things from the client's perspective, because I can see this idea of, OK, we've got two, there's two sides of the coin here from a, if I'm a customer. I've got to choose a technology platform, but I've also got to think about who's going to help me with that platform potentially. And we know yeah. the market is huge, you know, $370 billion, I think they estimate it to be worth by 2026. And there's been a huge amount of capital raisings and IPOs. So we know it's growing. 
you're working with different customers and different sectors. And so I'm, un I'm interested in understanding what's going on for them internally with their decision making set. Are you working with similar people and organisations? So I don't know, in a university, you're working with a vice chancellor or a senior lecturer of a department and the IT manager and a learning technology specialist. How does that work? It's, you know, it's all across the board um, in the higher ed sector. Um, it tends to be pretty formalized RFP process or request for proposals. It's a committee. Um, I would say over time that that has shifted. It, it was pretty common to see that be kind of a technology driven thing. So, uh, you know, a technology director, such as the role that I had, um, or a, a CTO, or you know, there's various different nomenclatures for this depending on the industry. But that technical function was driving that more and was the decision maker in early days. And I think that has shifted um, more towards the educational side, which I think is positive. And then um, it might be more of a veto type thing on the technology leadership side where they might say, this doesn't meet some minimum standard, right? Like security is a big driver there um, where the technology leadership might go, well, we've evaluated this particular solution. We don't feel like it's going to protect student data enough. And so we're going to, we're going to ax that one from the list. We're not telling you which one to pick, but just don't pick this particular one. Um, but it, it varies a lot by kind of the size of the deal and, and what industry. So, you know, in the, on the business side, in a, um, you know, very common kind of a medium, small size business. It's not uncommon. Maybe we're dealing with the owner of the business um, or you just pick a random title that maybe has budget authority. Um, could be the head of uh, compliance training or onboard, you know, like an HR type role. Um, it could be, uh, you know, maybe it's, selling training to their clients. So it could be um, someone with a kind of a client facing type role. Um, like we, we have one client that it, I think that's literally the person we work with is it's the person that's sort of in charge of onboarding new clients. And so that's, that's the piece. Um, so it, it's still very broad, I would say, depending on, Size is often a factor, which I think is very appropriate, right? Is um, if you're going to spend a uh, very large implementation, multi-million dollars, it makes a lot of sense to do a more formal, robust process versus um, if you have, you know, 50 employees and you need a, a compliance training function, it doesn't make sense to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars to pick the perfect solution. And do you ever find yourself encouraging uh, one of your client stakeholders to raise their voice? What I mean by that is to speak up and sort of represent their needs more. You know, can you sometimes say, okay, I, I can see, for instance, they're certainly thinking about this from some of the technical perspectives, but actually they need, you know, it will, I would encourage them to be working with their academic team, let's say. I mean, do you ever find yourself helping them to kind of scope out yeah. the project? Uh, we do. Um, for instance, um, we'll occasionally come in and, you know, in that consulting role and kind of evaluate a program. Um, so I can think of, a, there's a community college in California that we went out on site for about a week. And um, what we found in that case was um, it was actually still a bit driven by the technical side. And so when we were really looking at the, the needs of instructors, we, we had some things to say about, um, and, and in fact, it was, in this case, it was some simple advice. We were like, we highly recommend that you have a cross team stand-up meeting three to five times a week that include educational folks with the technical folks. And so that you're aware of the impact of what, what one team is doing on the other team. And it, in that case, um, this really stood out to me as um, when we kind of connected the dots and got some people together in the room, we, 
we found out that there was a very senior technical person that was spending about 80 hours a semester um, doing a, they were basically taking apart course backups and putting them in little pieces in order to upload them into the system. And it was because of a set, it was one setting, it's a two minute change that the senior technical person had put on, on the production server. And no, nobody had ever uncovered this over years. So it was something like probably on the order of about $20,000 a year that it was costing this organization one little setting. And because various people weren't talking. Um, so, so yeah, this does come up um, and, and, you know, gets into good change management and good, good practice. So we do really feel strongly that um the educational side should have a very strong voice in setting what the goals are. And then I kind of see the technical side as more like um, speaking to reality a little bit in terms of um, if you came to me and said, well, I want gravity to work differently than it does. I can't really change that. Um, but um, you know, if you were to say, Hey, I want the server to go faster. <laughs> I can tell you what that might cost. And, and I, and there might be some options to do that. So I, I think, and sometimes that gets abused, right? It, it's easy enough on the technical side is to use a lot of acronyms and um, try and speak over people's heads in order to get an outcome that is easier for you as, as the person running that technology. And so I, I, I you know, occasionally we see that kind of a, Dysfunction on either direction, where if it's overdriven on the, yeah, if it's overdriven on the educational side, then you have this sort of dynamic of you're asking the technical people to change how gravity works. But on the flip side, um, if it's too technology driven, then you can end up with well, kind of a culture of no. Where if it's just too inconvenient, then we're going to say we're going to say no to it, um, and and that. That's kind of a culture point for uh, for us at Moodle US is um, is to try to figure out how to say yes, uh, an informed and smart yes. So it's often yes and this is the cost that goes with it. Um, sometimes it's we can't do it exactly that way again because maybe we're changing the direction of gravity and we don't know how to do that. But um, here's an idea: if we understand, we try to understand the why. We understand the why, then we can often be creative to get to yes, we can do this thing that's important to you. Yeah, that makes heaps of sense to me. It's a balance in the middle, a mutual respect. And yes. you know, some of the things you've explained to me, it's as if you're operating as well as management consultants or a consultant in its very pure sometimes, form. Sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes we get into that, and that some of that is our you know, personal journey and experience of growing organizations and, and also seeing a lot of other organizations and what, what works well and what doesn't work. So as you said earlier, thousands of dollars can be invested or even millions uh, can be invested in this choice of technology platform and partner. What advice could you give organizations or education institutions that are embarking on that journey? Yeah, well, I'm a huge fan of piloting. Um, I've seen, you know, lots of very well um, researched kind of procurement processes. And um, at their extreme, you might see a spreadsheet that has 600 sentence fragments that are different features that you want. And there's a lot of gray area. And what is meant by any one of those sentence fragments? And it's very easy to just get a, a lot of yes, it does that, um, and only to learn with five or twenty minutes of using the platform that it doesn't actually uh, meet the requirement the way that you thought. So I'm a really big fan of you know whatever you're going to select is having some piloting in that process. In the case of Moodle and other open source tools, um, that can be fairly inexpensive. The, you know, the software is available. Um, you can try various things out. Um, 
at the same time, uh, learning management systems are very complex too. So there is a lot of value in um, having some guidance right around someone who's done that before. Um, but so that could even be a, like a paid pilot. And we, we recommend that a lot, especially if we get um, very complex projects coming in is to, is to do some piloting, um, see if the tool is a good fit for you around your most important use cases, and then um, also develop some understanding of kind of what the base tool does. Often what we'll see is that um, organizations that procurement, they kind of they kind of jump to the how and skip the why. And so then maybe you kind of go down a blind alley where you spend a lot of money to implement a particular how that um, maybe if we knew the why, we already have a solution for and it's much, le much less expensive. The, so, so that's some general advice. Really love pilots. I think that's a good way to actually reduce your cost and your risk because um, there's always the risk that you um, spend a lot on a procurement process and it doesn't actually get you the outcome that you thought it was going to get. And then, you know, you have a lot of changing costs or you're stuck on a, with a solution that doesn't meet the needs. The other thing um, is, and, and this is having been on both sides of the fence where, you know, as a K-12 director, I bought a lot of software. Um, so, so the other thing I would say is make sure that you match your procurement process to um, the actual size of the job. Um, and this is something that we've, especially early days with Moodle, as we saw, is we'd be asked to quote on a project. The process would assume that it's a couple million dollar project, when in fact, um, maybe we had a solution at twenty to $50,000, but I literally could not afford to respond because it would cost me twenty to $50,000 to go through all of the hoops for um, going through procurement, right? So that might be um, in the extremes, like come out twice for a couple of days and present, bring a whole team, present the solution to me, uh, fill out uh, 200 pages of documentation and on on my particular form, not on your form. So, the, the, the more, ex here's the correlation, the more expensive the procurement process, the more expensive what you're going to buy is. It is self-selecting. So, um, and again, that's very appropriate in a lot of cases, but I have seen mismatches where um, you get the million dollar procurement process for a $10,000 a year solution. So um, I, would, I would say kind of be sure you do a good survey to make sure what are market rates um, before I kind of put my thumb up on the scale with um, it's 10,000 to deliver the service, but it's uh, $50,000 to actually respond to my procurement. So now the cost is $60,000. I've taken up a lot of your time. I'm aware of that. Thank you so much for joining me today. That was a really interesting conversation. I'm sure our audience will get a lot out of it. So thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to have a conversation with you. And for those of you who would like to learn more, please contact us by the link on the screen. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.